Frame. I am Jay Lazarus Hawk. I'm Jamie Hall. And we are Rising Fire Productions. Uh, we welcome you to our 16th show, believe it or not. Coming at you at our new time as far as our live stream, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. every Sunday night from Black Lodge Video. Our guests today, we've gone in a new direction for us. We've got Fatty McClure and Cherry Cheesecake joining us, and they're from some of the local Memphis burlesque performers. And they're going to tell us a little bit about what it's like to be a, a burlesque performer in Memphis, a burlesque performer in the modern day, the kind of work and preparation that goes into putting on such shows. So welcome to the show, ladies. Thank you for having mm -hmm. us. You're very welcome, and thank you for being here. We appreciate you guys coming out on short, such short notice. Mm -hmm. It was very short. It was, it was very short notice, as many of our guests, you know, keeping it at the level we're at, that tends to happen. But uh, we were having a meeting with these two ladies just the other night regarding a photo shoot that you're organizing Yes, for a calendar. So why don't you pick it up and come along with it? We are going to, uh, all of us as Rising Fire, uh, we're going to organize a photo shoot, and we're going to do a kind of a 40-style pinup girl photo shoot um, at the Atoka Military Museum in Atoka, Tennessee. And I know if some of you guys have seen the pictures of when we did Grim Jack, uh, your fan film that you just shot a couple of weeks ago, uh, seen all the military equipment and the guns and everything. We're going to be shooting the photo shoot out there, um, and the reason why we're doing this is because when we went out there and we met Mr. Uh, McFarland and his son, we just fell in love with those guys. They're Absolutely. just really genuine people, and, and uh, we want to help them out as much as we can. So we're going to do the photo shoot, and we're going to turn the photo shoot into calendars. And we're going to take 40% of all the proceeds of the sales of the calendars, and we're going to donate it back to the uh, military museum to kind of help them along with what it is that they have. They've helped us, so... We want to try to help them as well, and spoke with you not too long ago about it, on, and another thing as well, and uh, wanted to bring you guys in, and we met with y'all, and y'all were really receptive to the to the idea of it, so give us some thoughts about what you guys are thinking about as far as the photo shoot, is let everybody know what you guys are thinking about it. Well, um, I know that we have been really excited to do that traditional pinup calendar for a long time. Um, but really making it something that's quality and really interesting, it takes a lot of work and knowing the right people. And so it's always kind of fallen on the back burner when it comes to, you know, developing shows and working on um, my burlesque school and working on our, our own individual talents. So when you had that idea, it was, it was perfect for us because we could be involved, but let the professionals handle all of the actual production work. So I personally am really excited. I love that old military look mm -hmm. in the 40s are just so inspiring to me. So I'm really excited to be involved with that. And I know that you have a, a flair for vintage as well. I do, yes, in case you couldn't tell. <laughs> 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 but um, yeah, we're just really excited. Um, we've been wanting to do this for a very long time, for like two years now, if mm -hmm, not longer. No. Yeah. I know you saw some of the photos. Did you actually see some of the photos of the location in question? I, I have not. I don't. I think I saw one, maybe. Um, they have got a sergeant's room, a, a radio room, room a pri uh, like a jail cell, uh, a camp jail, a camp jail. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, a conference or war room. War room. Yeah. yeah. Um, and there's there's what, five different wars represented. There. Five or six different wars are represented. Um, everything from cannon to bazooka to jeep to uh, crew truck to a half track to general's a car. general's car to a broken down Huey. Yeah. Uh, from the Vietnam era. It was a, a trainer's. A tra it was a trainer's marine helicopter. I believe he said it was landed too hard, mm -hmm. at which point they scrap them because it's cheaper to get a new one than it is to refit them. But, I mean, you've got. The, the general's car has a beautiful finish. Uh, it's World War Two, I Two, think. Yeah. Uh, putting it in the early '40s era. The half track was a working. We actually drove. This man drove the half track uh, out of the garage and through the yard there for our little film project. So it's running. They've got a Korean era Jeep, a Vietnam era Jeep. So you're going to be able to sit against, you know, 
pieces of equipment that are authentic to the eras that you're going to be representing. Mm. So that's got to, kind of got to be exciting too, to be able to have not just you getting your picture taken, but to actually be able to create a setting. Right. That's really fascinating to me. And the fact that you mentioned that all of those eras are represented is really interesting. Um, when I was running a troupe, we made sure to do a USO show every year. And the troupe that I started with performing in Alabama, they sort of started that tradition. So one thing we really liked to do was certainly cover that very traditional USO, like, you know, tap dancing kind right, of thing. Right, right. Um, but we also like to get into the more recent wars that are not seen necessarily as, as, as glamorous. Um, I know I did a few Vietnam numbers that were sort we, of We are strange. planning, me and my wife, who is going to be kind of my assistant slash um, preparer, I guess, you know, on a photo shoot, we've been discussing, you know, that we want to represent, you know, the, the World War One and Two, but we'd also want to put together some stuff, you know, for the Vietnam, that's kind of that's kind of close to us because her father was in Vietnam, so we want to do we want to do something like that. There's a, you know there's even the Civil War represented there. I was going to say it'd be interesting to represent oh, wow. yeah. and represent each of the yeah. wars they have in some way. As we well. we were planning on that, and you know, and, and besides all of that, kind of throwing in some extra stuff to where you guys can have some extra stuff to do whatever you mm -hmm. guys wanted to do with and. Um, Actually, we've been talking about, you know, doing some some T-shirts and stuff like that to where we can build more awareness for the museum, build more awareness for you guys, and, you know, just kind of a whole networking thing as well. But, you know, it's the excitement. I'm very excited because I've been wanting to do this for a long time. Pin Up Girls and Burlesque has been a part of mine and my wife's, you know, we love that kind of era and those things. Um, <clears throat> well, there's a huge, huge subculture. There is that is dedicated to the pinup and mm -hmm. to the burlesque. Whether it's the the darker side of Betty Page or the historic side of the Memphis Bell Girl, or you know whatever it might be, there's this subworld mm -hmm. of of people that exist, and and these ladies preserve a tradition. Absolutely. And many people aren't really aware that, you know, you think the USO, you automatically think the Andrews sisters, World right. War II. The USO is active today. Yeah. You right. know, they go to Afghanistan now. So th they're preserving a tradition that still exists. People don't realize what it is, what it's become, but we all have that recollection, that fantasy of what we think it was. Mm. What I'd like to talk about, or have you talk about, to give, you know, give our audience a chance to hear you speak, um, what you see are the differences, the growths, the things you face now as a performer uh, versus maybe an authorized USO performance type of thing where the government backed you going over there. What you have to go through to put on your performances. Well, when it comes to, I mean, <laughs> where should we start? Yeah. <laughs> um, it, there's, I mean, of course there are, are the benefits and then there's the drawbacks to that. Um, by putting on everything that is our own, by co-opting essentially our own performance, um, we have the freedom that we wouldn't otherwise have. Um, so in our USO shows, um, the with the tap dancing I was talking about, I did a number that I really loved um, where I did tap dance. I like pulled out a little piece of cardboard to like tap dance on which you're supposed to not see, but then the lights come up, and I'm like, oh. You so I keep going. <laughs> and I mean, it was just, it was so ridiculous and campy and cheesy, because it was kind of making fun of that right. super patriotism. Um, and we would not be able to do that if, you know, we weren't our own bosses, we weren't paying ourselves. Um, but, you know, then there is the <clears throat> paying yourself aspect of it. You know, if you... Are, are making your own budget at all, all times and you're, you're covering every co every part of it, you are limited in, in some ways by you know where you can go. Well, we've talked about how much we would love to go to different bases, um, even overseas, and perform in that super traditional vintage way, mm -hmm. um, sort of updated, but we just we simply can't do that because... Because of the costs. Exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, there's... 
there's definitely differences. And there's a lot of red tape now to get just, oh, yeah. I mean, no matter who you are, if you're not an authorized personnel, mm -hmm. as it were, getting on a base is not as yeah, easy it's, as it it's, to be. Yeah, it's not something that you just plan for, okay, next month I'm going. <laughs> With the way that everything is today, you know, all the terrorism and all the, even the home terrorism, you're, you can't, you're lucky you get through an airport. Much less exactly. getting onto a base, a military base. I can only imagine what they would think about my suitcase if I went as a burlesque performer <laughs> overseas, anywhere. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Have you considered maybe going to places like, I mean, obviously the naval base here has mm -hmm. been closed, but if you go to a, a community, uh, Lawton, Oklahoma, for instance, there's a, a huge base there. Go to one of the communities where there are military personnel but not go on base right. um, but of course you still have to sell yourself to a venue mm -hmm. you have to convince Get them there. that you're a clean show because now you face all I mean the stigma that you're just a bunch of girls up there taking off your right. clothes especially in the Bible Belt mm -hmm. Um, there, I I mean, there's a lot of, <laughs> then what? Oh, sorry, I can I get an amen? <laughs> <laughs> So I, I know, I mean, we face it just so, some of the themes okay. we have in our music, in our uh, movies. We face some of those questions, mm -hmm. some of those stresses. So I imagine with what you do, it is hard because you have to approach a venue owner. You have to convince them that your show is worth it. You have to convince them that your show can turn a profit. Then you have to advertise your show in wherever vicinity you're going to have this show i mean it's it's definitely i mean we know yeah. you know it, we can feel every bit of what you guys go through because it's it's the planning it's the preparations and then it's the expense right right it definitely there's so many aspects to it being your own manager your own boss your own producer your own director all of those things but we have really considered um the last uso show that we did we considered going out to millington and performing somewhere there and offering essentially like a free pass to um, vets or active. Um, so, I mean, it's definitely in our minds. We think that a lot of times, because we have this sub culture that you were talking about, it's sort of not necessarily subversive, but somewhat liberal, um, somewhat, you know, a little more out there. And I think that a lot of times our community is seen as not necessarily that close to the military aspect of it anymore as much yeah. because it's, it's not as cool or... Well, like Whatever. I said, people don't even realize that the USO still exists. Right. So, in their mind, maybe there's not a place for that mm -hmm. anymore. Right. Well, I mean, since the era, you know, Bob Hope used to do the US shows all the time, up until, you know, he was into his he was elder years. <laughs> yeah. He still did the USOs, and there's nobody that's ever, <clears throat> ever taken that over, which is a shame, because... I'm a big supporter. I'm a supporter of the military. I'm not so much a supporter of the government, but I am a supporter of the military. I have friends and family that are in the military and that have served. Any different who's wars. willing to take up that kind of cause, yeah, you know, and whether they be misguided or the government behind it be misguided, their willingness to take up such a position is something to be respected. And and I do think that what people in the USO do. You know what they do for the soldiers to take their minds off of what it is that they're facing every day. Absolutely That's something necessary. very important. Yeah, absolutely. And for people like yourselves to be able to go out there, musicians to go out there and do things for the soldiers, just lets them know people at home do support them mm -hmm. and do, you know, think about them. I almost think that now the type of thing you do is more important because. In the, in the 40s, when you had the USO shows, the philosophy was we're showing the boys why they're fighting, reminding them of the freedoms they're fighting for. Mm -hmm. You know, in some countries, what you do, oh, yeah. you know, in the, in the entire Middle East, burlesque is not going to happen. Yeah. Right. So you're fighting for the freedom to have something like that. So taking that to the boys on the bases, on the camps, and showing them and reminding them. Come on through. Go, go you guys right aren't going to bother anything. anything. Showing them and reminding them <laughs> what it is they're fighting for is essential to their own, to, to the individual soldier's psychology. They need to know that home exists. Mm -hmm. That they're not just out there, especially in a place like Afghanistan, where it's already 130 degree weather. Then you're wearing full <laughs> fatigues. Then you're carrying 30, 40, 65 pounds of gear. It's kind of important to be reminded of why you're doing that. Yeah. 
It is very, very, very much so because, man, I can only imagine, you know, what they go through. So it's it's good to separate themselves from what they have to do every day. How much time does it take to prepare a performance piece? A piece or a show? A show. Let's, let's go with the whole show. Yeah. Um, I would say anywhere from 10 to 6 weeks. I would say so. It depends on... That's actually quicker than I would have thought. We really try to have enough shows that were in people's minds mm -hmm. um, and they feel like it's kind of a regular thing instead of just having one here, one there, one here, one there. Um, we've always tried to establish, we'll have a big show every two months or a big show every, you know, four times a year or whatever. Um, and some of those shows, because we typically, um, when I was running a trip, we would meet every week um, and rehearse for two hours a week and we would all rehearse independently. I mean, there's a lot of time to put into a show that's going to run for two hours and then it's done. Not even considering, you know, that extra time that you take to put together costume, you know, promoting. learn new dance moves, um, promoting, of course, most important, um, you know, networking, things, these little things that people don't think of, and they think, oh, she's just getting on stage, she's getting naked. It's so, so time consuming and so exhausting, but in a really great way, right. you know? Right. Well, I mean, you get, you know, it's it goes back to what I said about us. We do a lot of this. I mean, we don't do the same thing, but we plan a lot alike what you guys do. And to to be able to get out there and do that work and then that two hour show is a great reward for what all the hard work that you've yeah. done. But you take it a little bit further because not only do you do the shows, but you also teach burlesque as well. Right. So I can imagine that takes up a lot of your time as as a performer and getting ready for shows when you do have shows. Right, every class that I teach, I try to think who's gonna be at this class? What do they know? What are they working on? What have we done already? What should we move forward with? And then I have to choreograph a number just as I would um, as if I were performing. I have to, weeks and weeks in advance, um, schedule everything and let everyone know because it's not a studio you can just drop in and it's there's a class every week you know I, I hope we get to that point mm -hmm. but right now where we are it's just not there so every class is like a show it's an individual thing and so we have to spend a ton of time pr promoting that and getting people involved um, and then me remembering the choreography developing this routine weeks in advance to tell people what to wear or what to expect it's I mean it takes on a whole new level but I've always been a dancer, I was classically trained, and I love that aspect of it. And one thing I think a lot of people are missing in the burlesque world, you know, like Cherry was saying, a lot of people think that you just get up there and take your clothes off. But anyone who's been in my classes knows that that's not the case. You know, there is a huge element of dance to it. You know, even if you're not a dancer, there's still knowing how your body moves and knowing what looks right and understanding the music because you know, you, you are up there dancing to music, right. whether or not you're really dancing or doing anything that remotely looks like ballet or anything like that, you have to be... Um, if it's not within, if it's not time, it's not time. Right. It's just not going to work. Right. And I feel like a lot of people get up there and the music's just kind of background and they don't really pay a lot of attention to it. So, you know, learning that and being really reverent of the music is, is critical. So I, when I can teach that to someone, and it makes all the difference in the world. It totally, it's fulfilling enough to make up for everything. So, so you said that you you classically danced before mm -hmm. and everything. What about you, Cherry? How did you how did you get your start within the burlesque? Was you a dancer before? Actually, I have to um, say thank you to Fatty because I actually took one of her classes and. Um, I was in her first intensive, not her first class, but her first intensive, correct? Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I just kind of fell in love with it. I saw a few shows. I saw maybe like anywhere from three to five shows, and including a couple of hers. And I fell in love with it, and I said, you know, i got to try this. Even if it's not for me, I want to try this. So I got into her um, classes, and I just really fell in love with it. Um, I can say that I have um, progressed a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> she had to teach me how to walk, like legit just walk, straight line, 
looking, you know, not drunk walk or anything <laughs> like that. She had to teach that to me. So I owe a lot to her classes. And every time somebody asks me, um, would you recommend her class? I'm like, hands down, yes. See, the, just that right there is an indication of the kind of work it takes. Because you had to start with walking. Mm -hmm. yeah. Something we have all do from pretty much age one People on. People don't think about this kind of stuff. It is so funny because, you know, you... You try to walk, but then there's, like, sexier walks, and she goes into it a lot with her classes. Um, did she have, like, three different there's, walks? Yeah, we learned, I think, three different walks in that class. Um, and each is a totally different mood. There's, like, the um, in heels, the dragging walk, you know, which is kind of, like, more highbrow and kind of, you know, sexy. And can, then there's, can you give us an example? Okay. All right, so we'll have no music. But <laughs> we we, got we the apologize that we have no music, but heels walk with the drag. And then there's the I know I'm sure you guys have seen old Bridget Bardot movies, where she walks heel toe, which sounds strange because that's how everyone walks. But when you're doing like a sexy walk, heel toe is not as common. But there's something that's so sexy about it. So she does this sort of like really kind of casual, very confident walk, barefoot. So we would do this for probably 30 minutes each time. So those were just two. But um, in addition to walking, we spent a lot of time just learning how to stand mm -hmm. in a way that emphasized the hourglass, mm -hmm. showed are you more casual, are you more glitzy, what's really your look. So we spent a lot of time on that too. Yeah. So. I always try to encourage them, don't be worried. I know we're going to spend a lot of time walking and standing, but we will move on. <laughs> well, it's, it's a fundamental thing. You have to start, I mean, you have to build a foundation before mm -hmm. you can build a structure. And, you know, there are uh, Bushido training for Japanese sword. You will sit there with a sword in your hand and you will do one thing. Right. Well, with everything, and that, you will do that for weeks. Well, everything's a technique. Exactly. You have to learn the techniques before you can be the person. Right. And it is a visual medium, <clears throat> and much like a photograph, when you're on that stage, you have to appear to people. There has to be composition, and like you said, you have to accent the body. And burlesque is is one of the things I love about burlesque is it really defies modern sexy. Mm -hmm. Modern sexy is a coat hanger right. with, with nipples, basically. <laughs> <laughs> and, and burlesque allows a woman to be shaped like a woman and learn to use and, and maneuver that in ways that are alluring and not trashy. Well, the, right. with the women of the era, you know, when, when, you, when you think about the Betty Page era, the Summer Storm era, and so everything like that, they had figures. They, what, they wasn't the, the runway models that well, we Marilyn have today. Monroe Marilyn Monroe was, you know, she, she was a size hips. 16. Yeah, right. she you know, she hips. wasn't a zero. You know. I saw an ad the other day, an old ad from the 50s, and it said, do you look more like this than this? And it showed like our modern sexy, like the coat hanger, like you were saying. And it was an advertisement for a product to put on weight so that you had hips and then you had a chest and you had arms that yeah. weren't sticks and that kind of thing. I thought it was so interesting. It was so completely interesting. opposite of, you know, now not it's, too long ago either. Now yeah. it's this diuretic or this other whatever to, right. to clean you out and thin you up. Whereas the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, mm -hmm. it was all how to become shapely. Let's, uh, let's take a look at one of your performances. We actually have a performance, I believe it's a Clockwork Orange. Oh no. From, oh my gosh. From the, uh, a, Kub a Kubrick performance. Yeah, from the, cult, the cult films thing that you did. So you can um, see the giant penis. You had sent us a link, but <laughs> if I remember correctly, we were there filming that night, uh, unrequested. We just kind of got in there. Um, so he actually had a cleaner clip than what That's you great. sent us. Yeah. So he edited something together. So let's take a look at uh, Fatty McClure doing a Clockwork Orange piece.
Let the storm and clouds chase everyone from the place. Come on with the rain, I have a smile on my face. I walk down the lane with a happy refrain. Just sing, singing. Fatty McClure doing a number for Clockwork Orange. Uh, that was, of course, sponsored by Black Lodge. Indeed. So, one of the things he was just saying to me as we were off camera was the grassroots element mm -hmm. of, you know, networking with other people in town to help get you out there. So. Yeah, I mean, Black Lodge is, he, you know, Matt and Brian, <coughs> excuse me, have always got posters of upcoming shows and everything like that. So it's great that a staple in Memphis would support you guys. I know that Matt goes to a lot of the shows. Mm -hmm. Yes. He, he actually has a poster right yeah, there. Yeah. <laughs> From the first so he goes to a lot of the shows and uh, I know a lot of friends. We have a friend that's in common that goes to a lot of you guys' shows mm -hmm. and has expressed uh, interest in taking your classes. It's actually my roommate, Miriam Snyder. So, oh, yeah. so she's she's shown interest in it as well. Uh, my wife has shown interest in it because, like I said, we are big, huge burlesque fans. Um, and that's one of the reasons why it kind of gravitated us towards doing the photo shoot. 
and I didn't get to say it a while ago, but when we were when we had our meeting, we were discussing everything. I was thinking about bringing some other photographers in to kind of help out, and um, I told these guys that I would say it, so I'm going to say it. Justin Mitchell, uh, he's a friend of mine that has been doing photography for many and many a years, and I love his his work. Has agreed to come on board. Uh, and said that he's not worried about making any money off of this whatsoever. He just loves the fact that you guys are going to be able to be in it. Uh, he loves the fact that he's able to be able to participate. Also talked to uh, Darrington, uh, a friend of ours, Darrington Reap, who is also going to be one of the photographers there. <clears throat> and I thought he was going to do backflips on the phone when I had said <laughs> something about it. So he is there. We are also going to look at a couple more people to bring out to do some of the shooting. Um, and it's going to be a lot of fun, and we're going to do a lot of things. With that being said, we also have something else that we discussed at that same meeting. It's been a big passion of mine, and I've spoken to you many a times about it, that I've wanted to do a documentary. And the first time that we ever met was at a uh, BOCI. And I walked up to you and I was like, I can't believe that we're finally getting to meet because I've been trying to get in contact with you forever. <laughs> I've had this idea for about a year and a half now, two years, that I want to do a documentary on burlesque, on Tennessee burlesque. Mm -hmm. uh, but when we sat down and talked, I'll let you guys know that I didn't want to do it just on modern burlesque, that I want to take it way back. Uh, from from the beginnings to, to the roots of it and then involve the aspects of what you guys are doing uh, get some behind the scenes footage of you guys preparing for your shows some of the stuff that you do in your class to help new people prepare for these things um, we also discussed that it's not going to be something that's quick and easy <laughs> but it's something that we're going to have to research into and when we had first met <clears throat> and I told you about that your eyes got that big because it was a passion. It was something that you were thinking about or had thought about as well. Um, with with that being said, and us kind of collaborating with you guys, what is important for for you guys as burlesque dancers when we start doing this documentary? What is important that for you guys to want to see in it? What is some of the biggest things? What are some of the misconceptions that? the stigmatisms, for say, that you guys want to see kind of go away? Well, I think the number one stigma that I deal with is that I'm a stripper somehow. And if by taking off my clothes on stage that makes me a stripper, then okay, sure. But what people mean when they say that is not is not just that action becoming um, a noun. It's It's... A totally different level it's something that I just don't feel comfortable with um, instead I have this very strong feminist you know movement behind what I'm doing and I feel like a lot of that gets lost not not on the people that come to our shows mm -hmm. because I think they see it and I think they feel it I think they well, I feel think the that's power. that subculture they actually it, it is it is the subculture and, and, you know those are the people that you see that are sporting a 50s look or right a, or it's the rockabilly. Page tattoo, or it's the rockabilly. The, the rockabilly age, or, or, or an alternative quality. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's the freaks, the geeks, the weirdos. The you know, it's those people that actually seem to be more open-minded, more right. accepting, and more. I don't, I don't necessarily mean this the way it'll sound, but seemingly more educated. Right. Towards the specifics of what that mm -hmm. culture is and what it's re what it's meant to represent. Right, and I think that. Being able to kind of show that to the rest of the world to see, oh, there really is a lot of thought that goes on beyond this. You know, there really is this ultimate goal that they're all working towards. Um, I think that would be incredible. I don't think that anyone has really explored that sort of emotional aspect of burlesque because, I mean, it's it makes perfect sense. It's a lot of women who are artists who are expressing their sexuality on stage. I mean, it's a recipe for strong emotion and, you know, deep feelings and being able to express that would be unbelievable. Uh, how would you answer, what does burlesque mean to you? How long does the show go? <laughs> <laughs> We've got an hour and a half, so... Well, to me... Short answer. Okay. 
I'll try to give you the short answer. To me, um, burlesque is all about, to me, I feel like women by nature own sexuality because they're the ones, you know, men have the supply and women, you know, control the demand. Um, or they control the supply and the men have the demand. So somehow in the last, you know, however many years, um, it's kind of become reversed and women are the ones that feel like they have to kind of bow to whatever a man wants when really it doesn't have to be that way. And I think that by standing on stage and saying, this is mine, this is my sexuality and you have to deal with that, then it's sort of like possessing sexuality back, taking that back. So to me, it's very much about the possession of sexuality. Um, and additionally, it's about the freedom of art. Right. And um, as a ballet dancer, right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Sexuality. So when I was in ballet, you know, it was very compressive and being able to do whatever I want essentially is, is for us to me. Liberating. How about you, Cherry? Um, well, there's, there's so much about burlesque and like her if I just went on and on. I, I'm sure I could, but, um, you know, one thing that's always stuck out to me with burlesque is body positivity, and that's mm -hmm. one thing that is a huge deal to me, you know, being a plus-size girl and being able to, you know, go on stage, we're not supposed to be seen, we're not supposed to be, you know, vibrant looking like I am, we're supposed to be in the shadows on the treadmill, you know, trying to lose weight, and not everybody thinks that, of course, but, you but know. But it, it is a predominant it is, cultural it is. thing. And being on stage and being able to, you know, basically give the finger to people is pretty awesome to me, which I actually have done that. I've actually given the finger to people, but... Um, so how, I mean, what's that like, you know, you grow up in a culture mm -hmm. where you are not what is the the desired effect. Uh, and then you get on stage and that all goes away because as Fatty said, you now have that that strength. You now have that possession and that power of your own identity, your own sexuality. It's very interesting. Um, there's it's just it's a very strange thing because when I'm on stage I, I want to give the audience a great show. I want to make the act that I'm doing the one that they're like. They stop me and they say, that was my favorite act of That's the show. That's the one they remember. You know, I want, I strive for that. But that doesn't mean that when I'm on the stage that, you know, all of that um, body negativity just goes away. You know, there's still people out in the audience that are saying, why is this fat girl on stage you know and I've gotten reviews I, I was talking about that recently mm -hmm. where some guy was like yeah it was a great show except they had a fat girl and I was like why is that the thing that makes the show bad for you like what is it inside of you that you can't look at a person like me you know it's called ignorance it but, is but <laughs> you, said it, you said it perfectly right what it is what is it in them Yes. That is the issue. It's was that always the case for you? Were you always able to say no. what is wrong with that person that they can't no, accept me? No, not at all. You know, about, you know, maybe six months before I started burlesque, I was very insecure and I, I hated myself and I really didn't like who I was. I didn't want to look in the mirror and, you know, before burlesque, you know, about six months before, I started looking at myself and thinking that it is okay to be me. It's okay, you know, to look a certain way. And I started, you know, being more outlandish because that's who I am. You know, I am the person who has the crazy hair and I wear makeup and big so glasses. So you kind of came out of the cocoon. Yes, and burlesque helps so much with that. I mean, haven't I changed so mm -hmm. much since I've started? Right, when she first started in the classes, I would tell her to like spread her legs and bump her hips and she would like do like this like, kind of like rock side to side. <laughs> I mean, and since it was being able to see her come into her own and really take possession of, of your body and, and that confidence is really unbelievable. And I had a friend of mine actually say, he's like, her, she's so confident. It's, it's sexy, you know? I mean, it's, confidence is it's sexy. sexy. Yeah. And that's what I, you know, 
for a long time. I, I can kind of live your nightmare vicariously because my wife was like that for a long period of time. She was uncomfortable with who she was because all television teaches us, all that you see on television now, you don't see a lot of plus-size actors and actresses on television. You don't see a lot of plus-size models walking the runway. You don't see a lot of fat dudes on televisions either. It's always the muscular, skinny, the muscular guys, the skinny, blonde-haired, blue-eyed, big-breasted, big-breasted chicks that consume television these days. And for a long time, I, I told I told my wife, I said, you have to be comfortable with you. It doesn't matter what other people think. It's an ignorance, is what it is. People have been subliminally taught through television, through movies, that this is the way that you have to be. And I applaud you, you know, for being able to come out of that cocoon, be who you want to be, no matter what it is. You know, people always judge everybody. It doesn't matter who we are or where we're from. People get judged. I get judged every day. True happiness has to begin with you inner. being happy with you. It's, it's an inner quality that you have to love. You have to love yourself before you love anybody else. Exactly, yeah. And I, I don't want to say that, you know, that's why I mentioned before burlesque, I did start coming out of my shell, and burlesque helped with that. But it wasn't burlesque that actually was, you know, it came within me. It's not like I got on stage one day and I was like, wow, I'm a vixen, you know. It was nothing <laughs> like that at all. But it took a lot of time, and burlesque really did help. I mean, um, But it, it's definitely been a useful maybe a tool towards that growth it and that definitely confidence. has and I think you're asking you know what element in your documentary mm -hmm. i think in our society now well we're on the edge of it changing because we do have people like adele yes. who mm -hmm. despite being a larger girl that amazing voice people want to hear it they don't care anymore so well, that's changing, but I think the positive female image, that right. self-image... There is, is the positive female image, and also one of the things that I want to touch on within the documentary that we do is is that stigmatism that you're just a stripper, right. where you're not. Going back to the dated times of burlesque or pre-burlesque or whatever you want to call it, everybody looks at it <laughs> like they see in the old Gunsmoke episodes or you know, Mrs. Kitty or whatever, they think that <clears throat> some of the dancers and some of the actresses that did that back in the day, that they were just there for strippers. Of course, some of that could be true, but some of it was still an art form. Some of it, a lot of it was still an Much art form. Much of it was. It was still a way of entertainment. It wasn't what people think about today is when you go into a strip club and all you have is dudes sitting around throwing dollar bills. It was still an art show. There were the bad elements, as you have in everything, but that's one of the things that I want to distinguish within the documentary, that, it, that the girls that do this, the ladies that do this, are not your typical, hi, my name is Thinneman, you know, kind of thing. The, Can I the, get a title? I'm, yeah. I'm so glad that's on film. <laughs> hey, at least I didn't call somebody else Clay Aiken, so. Um, hey, now. <laughs> and Jimi Hendrix wasn't on Sesame Street, so. It's just, it's the awareness. The awareness, the art form. I want to start with the history of, to give people what it is, then the the aspects of the art, then the aspects of what it takes, and then the modern aspects. Looking back, you guys being a part of the modern aspect, what is it that attracted you? Did you watch a lot of the older stuff? Did you know with the rise of Betty Page? Uh, and I hate just to single out Betty Page because there were a lot more, but she was one of the more iconic, and, and in my opinion. She started off doing kind of shows like this, but Betty Page was more of the domineering. She was yeah. she was right. what I referenced the first dominatrix queen. You know, I'm a huge Betty Page fan. I carry Betty Page everywhere I go because she's tattooed on me. But she really wasn't the start of burlesque. Not she at was all. she was the start of a domineering more of that femdom, I guess you can say. What attracted both of y'all to more of the history 
of burlesque instead of the modern thing? Um, I don't think that you can appreciate modern burlesque without the classic burlesque. Um, some of it is um, pretty corny and pretty funny. We've spent a few hours, you know, just sitting around watching some pretty awful old burlesque. Lent to us by Black Lodge, of course. <laughs> of course, of course. <laughs> but um, there is so much beauty in that, and it's just really... You know, the confidence. It's the confidence exactly. of the woman being on stage and is taking control. There's some really amazing old burlesque, too. Um, you know, Tempest Storm mm -hmm. was really yes. amazing. Um, just, there's so much greatness in, you know, the past, just in general. I, I love all of the stuff from, you know from the 40s, 50s, you know, the movies, the burlesque, you know, everything. And you just can't appreciate all of that without having all of it together. And you can't appreciate of, you know? in the time factor as well, because in those times, it was very much a male-dominated world. It was, And you yes. just didn't, you know, men just really didn't let their wives do things like that. Oh, no. You know, you have a stigmatism of the 50s household, yeah. where you was the man... You do what I say, and, you know, it, it, it went to that you're to be seen and not heard kind of thing. And what's interesting about um, the classical burlesque world versus the neoclassical world is that the vast majority of burlesque dancers and troops today are run by other burlesque dancers. So it's, it's almost entirely female. Um, back in the 50s and before, when burlesque was really getting started, it was another business. You know, it was men who produced these shows and told the women, you go on at this time, blah, blah, blah. But there was still something so, I keep coming back to the word unapologetic about their performances, where it was more like, this is my body, and this is the way I'm expressing myself. And if you don't like it, then... Well, I think, you know, up until more, more recent times, by and large, women have socially been repressed. Mm -hmm. You know, we talk about the suffragettes and all the, the, everything that changed, but... It really didn't right. for a very long time. And even today, in many ways, in many places, it is just harder for a woman than it is for a man. We don't want to think about it being true, but, you know, try being a woman. Oh, yeah. Tell me it's it doesn't true. come out true. <laughs> true. I've, I've seen it. Yeah. You know, I'm obviously not a woman, but I have seen how it can change. And, you know, I, I go through a situation and I watch a woman go through the exact situation and I see how much harder it might be made for by them right. or for them by men who they have to encounter within that situation yeah. so it still isn't completely equal by any means i would say by a long shot and yeah. you know you think about uh, the dust dust bowl era of the 30s when the traveling carnivals are going around and these women had no other means of putting food on their table they had to find something and you know at that point you're desperate all convention wears off. The, the thought of being proper doesn't really come before the thought of eating tonight. And to have the freedom, the strength to just express, to get out there, like you said, unapologetically, this is who I am, this is everything. It's kind of, it's an attitude that sort of evolved into the, for the right. modern day. I'm glad I got that on camera. Yeah, I had to give you something. Um, but it really is a case of, women taking control mm -hmm. and like you said nowadays these troops are women and teams of women and groups of women that are preserving this art form that is almost exclusively female performance yeah i mean you have your occasional mc or your clown or your gesture that you bring along or tag along to Entertain between acts. And everyone just sits politely through them and then wait for the other, the girls to come back on. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, the audience is there for the girls. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, they're there for jiggling women. Yeah. Whether, whether they want to admit that's what it is or not, there is that core thing. But there doesn't have to be the lewd element. It can right. still be art. It can still be something that's empowering to the, the women and the individual woman on that stage at any given time. Um, as he said, I commend you for taking up something like that because it is such a male-dominant world that to go out there and confidently tell men you can express your sexuality on their stage without them getting a certain impression, right. without them dismissing you or demeaning you, you know, or putting you down, 
that's a lot to face. It really is, and one of the things that's interesting about what you've, you've both been saying is that, you know, we think that we live in the modern world, and, you know, of course it's current, but I still, I don't think it shocked anyone when I started doing burlesque. I think that I've always been kind of that progressive, kind of contrarian person um, to my friends and family, but to this day, I am criticized, you know, by some people in my family, um, by some of my friends who simply don't understand it. Well, every, you know, it does, it goes back to what I was saying earlier. You're always going to be judged on something, mm -hmm. especially, especially in this area. We say it all the time. You're in the Bible Belt. You're There's actually a, at the buckle. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's a lot of things within this, this area that it doesn't matter, it, you know, a strong woman, a strong sexual woman. Anything like that, it doesn't matter. They're still always going to be in service there. I can put my gloves on. Uh, as I was saying, what what it is you guys do truly is an art form. It's dance. Like you said, you're classically trained to dance. You aren't bumping and grinding on a metal pole. You are working out routines. You are planning. You are dealing with venues. You're dealing with venue owners. You're dealing with girls and their schedules to make these things happen. You, and you're finding people like Black Lodge that support you and, you know, us who will support you and help get word out there. But we hope that the people watching realize what it takes and realize that this is not a whimsical Friday night I'm going to go take off my clothes. This is a lifestyle. This is planning. This is something that is part of our cultural history. And, you know, that is something that should be embraced, should be supported. Right, the sheer amount of Planning to plan is, is something of note. I know um, we, the Tennessee Tees produced a show based entirely around Edgar Allan Poe. And I think we spent two full days sitting and talking about how can we make this into a dance? How do we explain this? You know, how does this work? And um, by, by telling a story and by sharing an emotion or doing anything like that. I mean, there's an immense amount of artistic thought that goes into that, you know, beyond just the the physical rehearsal. There's so much thought. Um, there's so much development of that. It, it really, I mean, even if you were simply getting up and just taking off your clothes, there's still staging. There's lighting. There's choice of music. I mean, it isn't just a go do it. It right. never can be just do it. Any more than well, our with, films can just be With the be way that y'all, with you doing The Clockwork Orange, and didn't y'all recently do like a, um, like horror characters, you know, y'all, y'all put on a performance of different, different things, different categories, and that's really neat to me. It's creating characters. Yeah. yeah. Or working through a character that's already been through there with a twist on it. So. We're, go we're gonna uh, take another little cutaway. We're gonna look at another performance piece. Have I heard of Edgar Allan Poe? You, I was gonna say, do you have one from the Edgar Allan Poe? Yep. Let's go ahead and take a look at that one, and we'll be right back with you. <laughs> and now you're going to be cheated by a song to be danced by the Fadi McClure. inspired by a very brilliant short story about a letter that was purloined. You might remember that conflict from a story called The Purloined Letter. <laughs> <laughs> By Edgar Allan fucking Poe! <laughs> But no, no, no. 
Beats.
All right, our next performer is going to show you more of the classic style of what you might have came to see. That's right, burlesque. She'll be. All right, that was, was two performances. We saw a clip from the Edgar Allan Poe performance, as well as the Brazil performance, which, as I understand it, garnered you some sort of an award. Yes. So, what was that all about? Um, it was, I think, two years ago. It was the first Memphis burlesque show, showcase. And we had just come back from touring with our original cult movie show. Um, and I decided to do my burlesque, uh, my Brazil number um, for the showcase. And I was voted fan favorite in mm -hmm. Memphis. So it was pretty exciting. Excellent. And you got a little trophy. I for got that. a trophy. Yeah. <laughs> it's a gold lady with fans. It's probably cool. displayed next to your mirror now. Well, it's actually in my closet because I had a cat at the time. And I thought it was <laughs> Trust just me, like, I know all about that. And then I got a dog. I mean, it's just, so I just keep it somewhere where one day I can like put it in a case. On, on behalf of myself, my partners, congratulations on, on being the the Memphis fan favorite. Thank you. Um, additionally, and not quite as, as illustrious as a trophy necessarily, but you had mentioned that you had your performance of the cult film of the cult films show filmed mm -hmm. by someone and that you weren't necessarily a hundred percent pleased with the end result. Mm -hmm. um, as it turns out, we happened to be there. We filmed the show, and I haven't watched them myself, but my editor, Marcus Ken Hampson, presented me with a DVD to give to you of your performances from the cult show. So, there you go. You I'm just going to go some... home now. And... <laughs> <laughs> Got what you came and for, and you're done. I'll be, I'm just going to go. But that, that is something you'll maybe be able to, uh, yes. to use to help promote yourself and you know, Definitely. guide your classes even, show them some of your work. And, That's great, yeah. Uh, also wanted to mention, you, you are probably partly aware of this, but as you go towards making a documentary, uh, Kent, our cinematographer, is probably shot more burlesque than oh, any yeah. single yeah, cinematographer in this city. I already know. <laughs> so as soon as we can get all the, the different models to sign off on the different things. Well, with the documentary, I'm not saying that we're not going to start putting together some things, you know, some things like, I knew Kent had had a lot of stuff. Yeah. Um, me and him had talked about that before, but there's a big, there's a big show coming up, coming up later on this year. I think you guys were talking about something like in September or something. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're talking about doing a um, villain theme show where we're all going to um, be different villains and act out. We have um, a hip hop dancing Darth Vader, so I'm pretty freaking <laughs> excited about this show. Like, that's not even my number, and I'm like, okay, I'm ready. Can can it be September now? Or, uh, well, actually, no, that's going to be in um, August, and then in September they're having the um, Memphis Burlesque Festival oh, here. Think. Yeah. And that will have a lot of the local uh, burlesque performers competing for, you know, one of the titles that she won. And um, and then a few of the uh, tri-state area people, um, like from Little Rock and Nashville and Kentucky and things like that. Wow. Well, see, you know, that's what we were talking about, you know, being, you know, talking about doing a documentary doesn't, you know... There's a lot of planning, there's a lot of research and, and so forth and so on that you have to do for it, especially as far back as, you know, we're wanting to take it. Um, but, you know, we will be working on some of the things, getting some shots of some of the shows that you guys have, getting some of the, I'd love to get some of the behind the scenes of what you guys go through to get prepared. Uh, what it's like to be behind stage. Yeah, you know, as you're, you know, as you're transforming all from one dancer to the next, uh, there's so much to do, but there's so much to get as well. And I mean, I'm not going to wait, you know, for no, months and months not. and months to, to start trying to compile some of this footage and get some of these things. I believe that, you know, with the inspiration that you guys have given me and, you know, the things that we already do as far as being filmmakers, we're going to capitalize on a lot of the things, and then we will spend the times, you know, doing the research, digging into some of the older stuff. And that's where it's going to take the times. Yeah, definitely. You know, being able to get some of that old footage and, you know, yeah. if, if there's any footage at all. And, well, you may even want to look <coughs> at things like early 20s era silent films yeah. about 
biblical. I mean, the, the dance, not necessarily burlesque as a title, but the idea of the dance as performance piece mm -hmm. goes at least back as far as Ishtar at Babylon. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you're, you're looking at women who have used dance as a sense of empowerment since pre-Christ. Oh, yeah. So, and, and thousands of years previous. So there's a lot to potentially cover. Mm -hmm. And, you know, obviously if you were to go back that far, you don't necessarily have to spend a lot of time because really you're looking at something that grew out of America's culture. Right. As, as America or what passes for. Um, you're really looking at stuff that, you know, vaudeville. That was the real beginning of American entertainment mm -hmm. as an industry. And that would be where we saw burlesque really take a change from what it had been to what it became. Right. And I think that would be a point where you'd want to, you know, that would be your mark of that's, launch. Yeah, that's where where I was considering make the, like you said, the mark of launch. You know, I was going to touch on, you know, I was going to touch on some of that. I'm, I'm planning on trying to make it at somewhat 50-50, you know, uh, capitalizing on some of the things of the modern age, you know, of everything that, what it takes for you guys to get prepared for things, what it does to promote, how you guys promote, but also want to touch base on the history of it as well to give the people that have the misunderstandings of what burlesque actually is. Are there certain performers that predate you that stand out to you or as inspirations or, you know, even possibly even uh, one or two generations ahead of you that you've met and worked with or, or were taught by? I think um, a big inspiration for both of us, we talk about her quite often, is the, um, what was it, 2011 um, Queen of Burlesque, which is Miss Indigo Blue. Um, she was named the Queen of Burlesque at the Burlesque Hall of Fame, mm -hmm. and she's just incredibly witty, incredibly funny, um, and then her technique is just flawless. She is, um, you know, just one of the most amazing, and she's modern day as is she, well. Is she a younger dancer? Um, she's, she's definitely modern. She's, she's of this generation. Um, she's, she's definitely older than we are. Yeah. Um, she's been doing this for a while, but she actually came from stripping. So there's kind of this strange dichotomy a lot of times in burlesque where there's strippers that are now burlesque dancers and there's ballet dancers who are now burlesque dancers. And coming at it from totally two different angles but ending up in the same place. Um, but we both, I mean, adore her. Well, and she really is the... You, you touched on burlesque being the embracing of your sexuality. In ballet, everything is so rigid. Right. so trained and so practiced and so perfect that you don't really express yourself, you express your dance. Right. Stripping is raw, it's guttural, it's, it's lewd, it's brutal. Mm -hmm. Burlesque has a tasteful middle <coughs> ground that allows you, like you were saying, the freedoms to express and move in ways that the rigid rigidity of ballet wouldn't allow. Exactly. But you maintain your dignity and you maintain your allure in burlesque whereas you kind of swallow your pride and dump that on the stage when you're just a, a stripper right. and and you reduce it to the the baser instinct of sex mm -hmm. as opposed to sexuality right it's a service i mean it's it's all yeah. about your customer and it loses that emotional tie i think right Oh, yeah. yeah. Personally, anyway. And that's huge in burlesque. I mean, the personality behind the performance is half of it. So. Absolutely. So, with, we talked about the modern. Who would be some of y'all, uh, some of your influences as to some of the older? Old school. Yeah, yeah some of the old school women of. I'm personally going to say that Gypsy Lee Rose was. Oh, yeah. Uh, Gypsy Lee Rose. Just of amazing. I, I tend to go for the funny. I, yeah. I like the funny well, people. It, it's and funny you mentioned that because that was one that came up the other day when mm -hmm. we were having a discussion right after our meeting. So. Mm -hmm. I think that I mean I I love I love Gypsy as well, um, and one of of course one of the uh, the greats that I really look up to 
is um, going to be Sally Rand, of course, with the huge oversized feather fans. And she really, I mean, it's, it's everything that I strive for when I'm performing. She wore ballet slippers and she was, wore nude bodysuits. And I mean, there was something so incredibly alluring about her. And she performed it like some of the astronaut return mm -hmm. thing. I mean, just crazy. She was so revered, um, but so elegant yet so sexy at the same time. And she was, you know, again, she was just totally in control. It was her performance and everyone just, everyone loved it, but it, it would, it didn't matter if they did, you know, because it was about her and not about, about them. So, um, her technique is something that I love how she sort of married that with the actual, the more like raw feeling of burlesque. Now, do you guys go back to some of the originals and, mix that into some of the things that you do or you know everybody says with music with film with dance and everything that we all kind of copycat one another somewhere down the line yeah so their influences do you guys look at some of the olders like that and go okay I'd really love to do some of the things that she did and, and then kind of incorporate it into more of a modern day there's a specific number that I keep coming back to I don't even remember who performed it but it was a bedroom scene, and it was one of the performers from the 50s, and she was under a sheet on a phone, and she gets out of her clothes underneath the sheet, and it's unbelievable. <coughs> I, keep thinking, I have to do that. I, I would know love to do that. Exactly what you're talking we about, but I it. cannot think of that. Mm -hmm. I just realized that I said Gypsy Lee Rose, but I meant Gypsy Rose. Yeah. But anyway. <laughs> but yeah, and then actually, um, on the note with. Catch you. I know, like, everybody was just like, moving on. <laughs> There's this move that Sally would do where she would spin. She would just do um, little turns with her fans a certain way. And every time I do a fan dance, I, like, I back on her, like, here's the Sally move. And I, like, try to do it as good as she does, you know. So, I mean, I think that we, when I, especially when I teach a 101 class, it's all based in that. Because to me, you have to be able to do the classic, the classic moves, the classic personality, if you're gonna do the modern and the nouveau. So I know that we we go back to them for a lot of inspiration. Definitely. I, I want to, uh, just because we are engaged in conversation and we'll continue to just do that, um, we have about 40, 45 more minutes left. I wanna make sure that we do actually tell people <laughs> where your class is, when your class is, how much your classes are, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, any contact information, websites, Facebook, phone numbers, whatever it is you want the public to have, go ahead and take an opportunity and tell them now because otherwise we're just going to come converse right <laughs> to the end of the show and never do that. So. Okay. Well, um, I run the Fatty McClure School of Burlesque, and you can learn all about us at fattymcclureschoolofburlesque.com. We have a four-week intensive coming up starting on May 20th, and that's every Monday for um, a month. That's from 7 to 8.30. It's at In Balance Fitness, which is on Cooper Street, and it is $100 for all four weeks. It's suitable for all levels from total newbie to professional ballet dancer and takes you from the living room to the burlesque stage in just four weeks. So that's a really fun way to get to learn a little bit about burlesque. It's the um, the academy that Cherry went through and became a burlesque star out of. So I highly recommend it for anyone who's interested in burlesque at all. Um, additionally, we will be having a burlesque 101 single class on Tuesday, June 4th. That's 7 to 8.30 as well at In Balance Fitness. And that is only $20. It's just one single class, a great way to get a little bit of exercise, get your heart rate up while raising the pulse of others, <laughs> right? Um, and you can email me <coughs> at fattymcclure at gmail.com, and McClure is spelled M-C-L-U-R-E, <laughs> like McClure. <laughs> yeah. um, but you can always find me on the website, fattymcclureschoolerburlast.com. You can like us on Facebook through there, and follow me on Twitter at Fatty McClure. That's it. Excellent. Okay. Now, do you have any performances coming up? Right now, I don't think we have any that are um, publicly announced, but they will be coming up soon. Right now, we are looking at a few different venues. I'm really looking at um, theater venues because that's what has uh, made me the most happy. Um, and I think that a lot of people really enjoy the theater versus the bar. Nothing mm -hmm. wrong with the bar, but... 
people it does make ask, it easier yeah people ask for the theater so often and we're looking at a few different theaters right now but um but I'll do my spiel. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Um, so I am Cherry Cheesecake. Hi. <laughs> and um, I run the Southern Shimmy Show, and you'll be seeing us around town really soon. Um, we have a website coming up, which will be southernshimmyshow.com. We have a Twitter, a Facebook, an Instagram, an Etsy, everything that you could think of. So just try to look us up. And then I'm also on every single social media site ever and as you said you're sort of a self-professed queen of the social media i am i feel like i just do social media all the time but it's so it's, calming well, <laughs> it's, it's weird al it's also a necessary evil it, mm -hmm. you know, it or is. i see as a necessary yeah, it evil really is in if, our modern day if you don't promote then no one's going to come to your show and you're just right it's like I could be doing burlesque in my living room. Well, if, if you don't myself. exist on Facebook, you don't really exist in people's minds nowadays. Right. I so agree. you kind of have to create a, a virtual presence to have a physical re result. Right. A physical presence in your at your show. Yeah, we really. I mean, it's unbelievable the amount of promotion that we have to do. Um, but we had a couple shows recently that weren't promoted as much on um, Facebook and Twitter and they were the same show you know it was it was the same people the same same everything well, but you have a fan base yeah. right right but the, the turnout was just not there as much as it had been when we'd really promoted we would sell out shows regularly um, and that's just because I don't think people that's where people go to get their news yeah. so um, I mean I in my other life I'm actually a social media marketer <laughs> so um, we definitely life? understand the importance of social media, and I think it's really interesting about the kind of modern burlesque now is you can develop this sort of <coughs> personal relationship with a lot of the performers. You feel like you get to know them, and they're not just this model or this doll that's on stage. It's like they're real people. So it's, that's something that's really, it's definitely different about um, burlesque now versus as it was and that's kind of what i was doing when i did my little shout that i really hope people understand that mm -hmm. this truly is an art form this isn't just needed to pay the rent so i went and took right. off my clothes it's not there gonna work you're not gonna be able to pay your rent with yeah you're gonna starve <laughs> no, you're is that starve. what you're trying to say yeah. you're gonna starve it, it is yeah. an art you have costuming and as we said you have the stage and all the other things that you have to organize and you got to be responsible for all of that Right. you got to put that all together. The amount of work that goes into one of your performance, to me, doesn't seem so dissimilar to the amount of work we put into one of our short films. Mm -hmm. It's a production. It because, is. It, because, well, all the same things. Mm -hmm. Who's in your cast? you got to put together your troupe. What are they wearing? you got to work on your costumes. What are the routines, which in your case are what are the dance routines, and in our case that's what are, where are the camera shots, where are the lights going, all that. You have to work out lighting and music. We have to work out lighting and music. So there's all the same things. And then, of course, when you do have to actively have a performance, you need an audience. Mm -hmm. When we're ready to actively film, we often need extras. And it's the same thing. You have to promote. You have to get on that social media. You have to shout out. You have to constantly scream into the wind yeah. that yeah. you are out there doing what you're doing to get even the slightest response. Because... We are in a day, or in an era, where the arts are suffering. Our, our government, our governing bodies, whether that's state, city, or, or uh, even federal, are truly not supporting any level of the creative arts. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, it is our creative arts which build our culture. It wasn't through the wars that we built our world. It was through the renaissance that comes after right. these things where, where we learn new ways of expressing and we take the lessons learned from those conflicts and move forward and in, in progress and create new things and new cultures. And burlesque is a part of that, whereas stripping is stripping. Right. And there's such a, I, I can't stress it enough and I'll probably repeat it again, there's such a vast difference between what these two things are that I really, really hope people can grasp how much of an art form it truly is. Understanding how to use your body. Any model that's walked a runway, 
any model that's done a photo shoot will tell you that is not easy. And right. once you know it, being able to do it, being able to hold it, mm -hmm. you know, there are moves that I've seen you do on stage that I would cramp up if you just tried to teach <laughs> Which to is me. because you're old. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> but it really is. I mean, it's... There's physical training, there's emotional oh, yeah. training, there's mental training, there's all of the social media, well, it's there's like all she of said, the production you, you get your heart rate up. I mean, it's 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 not something that you are going to go out and, and do and not expect to to sweat and mm -hmm. to move. I mean, it is a almost a form of exercise, like, you know, Absolutely. I mean, it, it is. It and, is very much. Uh, one question that I, I'm really wanting to get out. <clears throat> If I Google you, there's, both of you, there's a lot, you know, you have your pictures up there, there's, there's a lot of things about you guys on there, and um, how does that, how does that play for you guys on the outside of all of this, when you're, when you're out and about, you're with your friends, As your you said, boyfriends. In your other life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in your other life, you know, when you're out and about with your boyfriends or husbands or whatever the case may be, how is that for you guys? You know, because in this town, I don't, I'm not sure about anywhere else, but in this town, it's it's getting more and more popular. More and more people are recognizing. I don't know if you caught it, and I know she didn't, but right here while we were doing this show, you were There was a guy that was, hey, that's the gentleman Cheesecake. walked in. He's yeah. A, he's over there. Is he's there like, really? What? Yeah. That's who gonna are make a he, he, he looked at Brian, he's like, who, who are those? That, that, it's Cherry Cheesecake and, uh, <laughs> and he couldn't think of the name. And, yeah. he's like, and I could see him mouth the word. I retired so. for too long. <laughs> so, <laughs> you've already, just, just sitting here, we've mm -hmm. witnessed that in a town this size, you're gonna get recognized. I was recognized at a um, Target dressing room one time, and this, this lady was like, "Hey, it's Fatty," and everyone thought she was being really mean, but uh, she wasn't. She was just calling me by by my name. But I mean, it's it's a great point. It's it's impossible to hide it. And um, I actually I quit burlesque right before I went to law school um, because that's just not okay. It's just not. Um, and I realized when I was in law school, <coughs> I hate that I can't do what I want. And I quit because when people tell me I can't do something, it makes me want to do it so much more. <laughs> so, um, I mean, Creative that was the people beginning have an of it. Imperative. They do. Yeah. They, they really do. Yeah. But, I mean, I, I've had problems with, you know, my boyfriend now, fiance's family, you know, knowing about this and not, not taking the time to to learn about it and explore it. They make judgments because they think they know about something. Are they, do they happen to be Southern Baptist? raised oh no no very much different but um it's it's so complicated but it's not unusual you know and some of his his friends have said that, i mean it's just you know i've actually had clients that have said to me so are you fatty mcclure and i'm like now they think that i'm gonna go on their their facebook and their twitter doing their social media and i mean it's just these you can't separate expect yourself. That you're just gonna start dropping your clothes while right you're... like i'm I, I don't know. Those I don't nude pictures of yourself. Like, well, right. You know, it's totally really funny brand. because I think you were in Best Buy one time, and I'm not <clears> sure. <throat> one of my friends said, "Oh my gosh, I know who you are." And I, somebody that was with you is like, "Yeah, you've probably seen her on stage naked or something like that." And they just <laughs> they kind of looked as like, "Yeah, I did. How'd you know?" <laughs> you know. But I'm sure you get that all yeah. the time. You know, and I'm sure people approach you guys all the time when. When you're out having a meal, when you're out doing things like that, how how is it that you deal with it? I mean, because you guys are in a limelight now. Mm -hmm. We're public. I, I think it's really funny um, being noticed because I don't feel like I'm famous or whatever. Mm -hmm. I always joke about it, and I'm always like, am I famous now? <laughs> Which... I know that I'm not, but it is really weird to get noticed. And, of mm -hmm. course, like, having this look, people are going to, you know, they're stare at me. They're going to see you either way. Yeah, they're going to stare at me. I go to the fair, you know, and people are like, the fuck? You know? <laughs> and I'm like, I'm sorry that I'm wearing high heels at the fair. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's just what's going to happen right now. 
But, like, I have been noticed that some shows, like, I went to the Pretty Things Peep show recently, which is a great out-of-town burlesque, and, um, and I got a few people being like, hey, you're Cherry Cheesecake, and I was like, this is weird, but thanks! <laughs> it, it, it is a weird feeling. I, I mean, I can, I've that. recently gone through that. Well, we recently went through it here. Mm -hmm. you know, we walked in, and, you know, this, uh, a, a local actor... Kristen Walker was here, and we're all really great friends with Kristen. He's he's a great guy, but he has this girl that was with him, and she walked out, and you know, go, you know, hey, this is. She walked right up to us. And she's like, yeah, I know who you guys are. And <laughs> wow. like, what? And then we had our premiere for my film in Tupelo, and and it was very weird that people <laughs> would walk up to me and go, "Can I get a picture with you? Can I take? Can I yeah. get your autograph? You know, and all this. That's a weird." That's a weird feeling, you know, and when you're out in public and people do that for you, especially with you. Um, I know a little bit more about you than I, do, you know, do Cherry, and I know you do have a fiancé. What is it, not only is what is it like for you, but what is it like for him? Well, that's yeah. a great topic. <laughs> uh, I hope he's watching. Um, we actually met on Match.com mm -hmm. because at the time I was working in music. I was working... In burlesque, and I, I was meeting the same kind of guys over and over and over, and I knew that wasn't really what I wanted. So I was very clear about before I met anyone. I said, "I'm a burlesque dancer. If you don't like it, move on, because I'm not going to stop." Um, and so of course he was like, "It's great. I love it." Um, but a year and a half later, you know, it's uh, there's something I don't understand is that he doesn't like other guys looking at me. But to me, it's like. It's guys almost like that look. ultimate, that ultimate is like, other guys are looking at me, you should be impressed. Right, that's, he was like, you wouldn't like it if I did, I'm like, I would think it's, I'd be, I would be like, high-fiving the chicks, I'd be like, that's my I mean, mom. coming from a male perspective, <laughs> you know, coming from a male perspective, it, it is a lot different. Right. You can say those things, and you can do those things, and then when it starts happening, you know, it's like, yeah, I'll support you, and, you know, if the guys come up, you know, let them shake your hand and say hi, but there is that intimidation factor, you know, because... Ultimately, guys, there's two issues with probably 100% of the men in the world. Insecurity. And the thing and with their cock. <laughs> well, there's the insecurity, and there's the possessive. Right. W women belong to us. They aren't, they aren't their own individual. They're right. one of our possessions. Whether that's a subconscious thing or a conscious thing, it's a dominant male mindset. Right. And I know my wife is standing off off screen, and she's thinking about a couple of incidents, you know, where I'd really choke somebody out, you know. <laughs> but with you being Fatty McClure mm -hmm. and your fiance, it's a difference than what I'm talking about with 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 me and my wife, or you and your wife, or something like that. You are a lot. You know, you Google Fatty McClure, and it's there. Yeah. I mean, I can imagine it can be a little bit hard, mm -hmm. harder on him, but, you know, you did warn him. I know, I did. <laughs> I personally feel like, um, well, I have a, a little story that I tell people most of the time when this kind of thing comes up. Um, I used to hang out with a lot of musicians, and I would go to shows all the time, and if I were ever at a show, I, on the reg, I would hear these men say, nasty things to me just horrifying things like I will not repeat them kind of things when I perform on a stage half naked and a man comes up to me after the words they were like that was really beautiful I could tell you were a ballet dancer I'm like I never I never have heard anything remotely nasty by a man at all women get a little weird sometimes but men <laughs> again, women have that caddy insecurity. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, it, I mean, I've heard them say strange, like strange come ons, that I don't yes, hear from a man. Yes, yes, it's, it's so weird. weird because I remember I was trying to date for a while, and just when, stop. when you're dating no. and you are a burlesque dancer, men are like, "So can I get a private show?" Every single time, and I'm like, <laughs> "That is so old. Like, could you think of anything better, please?" And it's like, at first, they're like, that might be hot. But then they're like, oh, God, no. I don't like that. And um, I don't know. But when I was just dating, I would tell these guys, they'd be like, 
do you ever get hit on after the show? And I was like, by women. Yeah. By w- women are just like, so I feel like maybe they're empowered mm-hmm. and drunk and you know, it's like yeah, a combination. Well, the whole "Can I have your autograph?" Mm-hmm. the "Oh my God, your cherry cheesecake," mm-hmm. your fatty McClure. A lot of that is that many people don't have either the drive or the guts to reach for something that they may dream, or they don't even know what it is they want to to reach for. Right. And then standing right in front of them is someone who they have seen do something that they perceive as awe-inspiring. Right. Oh my God, you made a movie? Yeah. <laughs> oh my yeah. God, you get on stage and, and dance in front of people and you're confident in it and you don't feel insecurities and you aren't a 10 by Playboy standards? They don't understand that in their lives because they don't have that courage. So, yeah. so there's a vicarious energy that they're getting, and that's why, give me your autograph, that's why can I have my picture yeah. taken with you? Because they want to feel like they touched something that is otherwise unattainable to them. You know, I'm, I'm done nobody. <laughs> you know, that's the way that I look at it. But, you know, you guys are a lot more. And the reason why I ask that question is because you guys are a lot a lot more in somewhat of the limelight kind of thing. You know, I went on to, you know, we were talking about the other night about your Facebook. And he was like, I have so many friends, you know. And friends. It, yeah, yeah, friends. You know, some of them probably creepy. Some of them, you know, just whatever. But it, it, it is important, you know, it was important to ask that question because a lot of people don't understand, mm-hmm. you know, some of the creep factor that could lie within this. You know, you are in the public eye a lot, and especially with you. you. You do do a lot of different things. You do a lot more business aspects because, like I said, we met at BOCI, and I think she even did some blog work for us at one point, and you are in the face of that business mm. where you deal with a lot of people's shirt and ties and everything like that. And, yeah. you know, it, it can be that... It's an odd crossover. Yeah, it's, it, is. It's, it is an odd crossover. And actually for um, when I decided I'm going to be a businesswoman now, you know, I, um, I had been so burnt out with running a troupe and trying to deal with all the personalities and all of the mess that comes with burlesque and I wasn't enjoying performing anymore so... I decided to retire essentially, and um, I tried my my best to get all of those connections from my per- my like actual you know given name to Fatty McClure. Um, I even called up some reporters at the Commercial Appeal and like made them change their articles that were online. Um, but what I realized, as you know, I I don't really want to have to. The reason I want to work for myself is I don't want to have to do anything that I don't agree with, or I don't want to have to not do anything I don't agree with. So why not do this? And I actually, I was retired until like a month ago, whenever the last show was. And, um, I showed up to the, the troop show, the cult movie two, that, um, was essentially by the troop that, that became after I left the Tennessee tees and people, I mean, I was, it was left and right. People were like, why aren't you performing? Can I get a picture with you? Can I get your, I'm like, I'm not even performing and you want an autograph? This is bizarre. And I just, I loved it. And I've been hearing Once so much of favorite, it. Always Once a fan favorite, always Right, yeah. that's, that's my exactly. tagline, actually. <laughs> um, uh, but it was, you know, I missed that. It was like, I, I had been struggling so much with trying to make a troop work and making, making this culture in Memphis that, I didn't realize that my performance meant anything to anyone, um, but it wasn't until I was being recognized, you know, without the eyelashes and without the pasties, that um, I decided it may be worth coming back. So it's been a while. Now, what do you yeah. what do you do? Like I said, I I know a lot about Cheryl. We've talked several times before, mm-hmm. but what is it that you do in your everyday life, your job, you know? those those kind of aspects well i work retail hill and uh, i right am there with a you. <laughs> makeup artist by trade i'm also licensed to do hair but i just like makeup better and um yeah i don't get noticed at all at work and if they do notice me at work then they don't say anything i mean 
I regularly get stared at, but I think that's just like they're taking in all of what's going it's on. It's bright. We're in the burbs. It's too. bright. <laughs> it's bright. <laughs> they're like, are you going to mess up my makeup? <laughs> but it's just, I don't know. I don't know. I don't think I've ever been noticed in that way. If I go to a show, yes, yeah. people are like, are you performing? And I'm like, no. Or yes. But, um,. I don't know. I've never really been told anything like that. I've never been to like Target and been noticed yeah. that awesome. I can remember. Give it time. Yeah. I, it, 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 it's due great. diligence. It's coming. <laughs> well, I, it, I've gotten Facebook messages later on being like, I thought I saw you somewhere, like Starbucks or something. And I'm like, oh yeah, I was there. And they're like, I was really scared to say anything. And I'm like, I'm not even scary at all. I look give like. Give it a little bit of time. I yeah. look like. A cotton candy like person. Of a okay. light bright. But you don't. But you, <laughs> light bright. But you look like something that not everybody has the courage to look like. Mm -hmm. You know, and when, I, can, I, when I, I had blue hair or purple hair or green hair mm -hmm. or when my wife had her red hair or her blue hair or her purple hair, it happens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, no matter where you go. It happens to me. You know, it happens to me at our acting classes. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people. We had a gentleman come to our acting classes and he would not talk to me. And I'm an it's acting scary. coach. He said I was scary. I was too intimidating Aww. for him. And you know, and people, uh, people are are like that. It's like I, I, you know, it happened to you. You know, not too long ago. You know, I just, I, you're Jay Lazarus Hawk. I need to talk to you for a second, but I don't want to bother you. <laughs> or you know, you're Jamie Hall with Rising Fire. I want to talk to you about something, but I don't want to bug you. But we are approachable people, you know, and I'm sure you guys are approachable people as well. I'm actually pretty mean. <laughs> <laughs> she is evil. You know, it is it is weird how, how many people will think that because you do what you do, and I'm not saying we don't do a lot. Yeah. We are very right. busy. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean we're not people. We yeah. are just exactly. people like anybody else out there. We all have to eat. We all have to go to the bathroom. We all have to sleep. <laughs> It, it well, really sometimes is. we sleep. Yeah. Well, we don't. Very little. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes very little. we sleep. I don't. Maybe it's a filmmaker phenomenon because none of us seem to sleep. Yeah. But not. You know. No matter how you look at it, we are just normal people. Mm -hmm. It's just that being that creative person, as I said before, there's a compulsion. I have to make film. Mm -hmm. I have wanted to quit several times in the past few years over one stupid frustration or another. And I've had, you know, one partner or another tell me if I did that, they'd hurt me in a severe way. <laughs> um, and, and I'm grateful for that. Mm -hmm. But it's so hard to keep going. And yeah. we are people. We feel pressure. We feel stress. We get tired. We get distracted, and you know we 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 all we all have that feeling of I just want to quit. Oh, yeah. You know, there's yeah. there's always that feeling. But of, there's that compulsion, you know. I and I off he Kent, who's my roommate as well as my partner, can tell you he's heard me many times. I just want to quit, but then I realize, the hell am I going to do with myself <laughs> yeah. if I quit? What else am I going to do? You're going to come back. I'll, right I'll, back. I'll end up right back here, yeah. or I'll end up in a rubber room somewhere. <laughs> well, I mean, you're a testament to that. You you wanted to quit. Mm -hmm. You quit for a little bit, and there was something there. You had that, to quit quitting. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I mean, I absolutely, I could never say that I have nothing to do. I mean, it's always been hard for me to pick an art form and stick with it, because I'm like, well, if I focus on dancing, then I won't be able to do music. And I really love music, but I love dancing more. What about art? I mean, it just goes... <laughs> on and on and on but there was something about the movement and the expression of movement it's so I mean it was a little easier to hide when I lived alone um but now my fiance is sometimes I like think he's not watching me but I'm like dancing in the kitchen <laughs> he's just like I just have to so I as mean, I said a compulsion right it will never ever leave me but the <coughs> the fact that I was missed on stage was enough for me to go back into that. I know it's going to be stressful. I know it's going to be a lot of work, and it's some days I'm going to be like, "But why?" But <laughs> you know, there was there was that that moment that was enough for me that will hopefully I'll be able to hold on to and remind me of that. Well, in the I can agree with that because for years, uh, for years I was a musician, and you know I played music for a long time. And actually got some big time recognition out of it, and then I walked away from it. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
dropped the microphone and didn't look back. And my wife and myself were talking one day, and I, you know, I told her, I said, you know what, I really miss being a musician again. And even though that my life is consumed mm-hmm. with, you know, filmmaking and family and 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 work, because I work in retail hell too. So, yeah. um, uh, I work in retail hell. The eighth uh, ring of yeah, the eighth <laughs> ring of the gates uh, are there, but I really miss. Sometimes I really miss the aspect of music of being able to yeah. hook up with my bandmates and be able to play. And I think that's the life of an artist mm-hmm. because you want, like you said, you want to try to tackle everything artistic that you can, that you feel like sometimes you neglect one for the yeah. other, and. Uh, but that's going to happen. Yeah, you it, know, it does. Right. You're going to gravitate towards that one that really mm-hmm. is the need. You know, I, I would love to be a musician. I can't play a note of music, and <laughs> I don't know that I've ever sung on key. But I love it. Mm-hmm. But I have to make film. I have to tell stories. Mm-hmm. So that's where it's always going to come back to. You know, it's really funny because... Um, I remember reading something online where someone was like so frustrated. It was another burlesque answer from another um, state. And she said, she was so mad because she was like, someone asked me what my real job was. And I just started thinking about it and I was like, real job? That is such a weird term mm, because I, I was actually I mean, going to quantify that statement. It's like we have. 20 jobs all in one and people think you know again they think oh she's just on stage no the (coughs) costuming the dancing the lighting you're a dj you're everything Mm -hmm. creating this um you know three minute act Mm -hmm. you know it's just like it is such a consuming thing but it's yours and it's mm -hmm. just so i've often had that discussion with people because Mm -hmm. i'm technically speaking unemployed. Mm-hmm. I do not get a paycheck. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. However, what I sit in my at my desk and do at my home office is five, six, seven different careers yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. worth of work. Yes. Yeah. And I'm trying to stuff it all into, you know, one human being's daily routine. <laughs> well that's what, <laughs> so you know, people at my job ask me, say, Hey, you know, what are you doing after work? And I was like, going back to work. Yeah. He's like, what do you mean going back to work? I was like, I've got three scripts to break down and read. That's not a job. And I was like, <laughs> it might not pay me, but it is, it's a fucking job, man. It's, it's more of a you job know, than any retail job. A lot, of, a lot of our passions we consider as our jobs. Yeah. I mean, whether we get paid at them or not, because they take work. Mm-hmm. They take a lot of work. They and take especially, work, they take time, they take effort and energy. Yeah, they do. Now, there's some days that I just give a damn less about it, you know, and, and zone out and not get out of the bed at all, uh, hence the last three days. But, uh, you know, there you know there are times that I know you guys love having the downtime to be the people that you truly are, to be able to associate with friends without having, having to think about your passions, to be what I call a, a real person sometimes. You know, to for me, it's to be able to sit down with my 17-year-old and my 3-year-old and just talk about nothing. Just listen to the 3-year-old ramble on about anything. And, you know, I, I, we're up getting near the end of our show, so I don't want to get too in-depth on a topic, but for you having the fiancé, mm-hmm. I would imagine it's extremely important that you have someone mm-hmm. that can be the island in... The chaos that is organizing your daily life, your routine, your day job, your real job. <laughs> Organize that and balance that against the other job, right. which is often probably where a lot more work, a lot more effort, and a lot more energy are going. To have that certain someone, your wife, my wife, mm-hmm. your fiancé, um, I don't know. I have a boyfriend. To, to have that... <laughs> I, it's new. <laughs> I was, Uh-oh, there's the announcement. I'll, I'll there it is. Announcement. Later. <laughs> to, to have that person in your mm-hmm. life as, as an anchor right. is an extremely important thing. Yeah. 
Yeah, and he is he's unbelievably supportive. He really is. He was so supportive of me when I actually decided to quit my real job and, you know, take on five others. So, I mean, whether, <laughs> you know, every day I wake up and it's something different, you know, I may, like last week I had to work um, a full day on the burlesque because I was teaching and I was trying to do graphics and promotion and then the next day I was working with my social media clients. The next day I was working on my vintage t uh, clothing TV show and then the next day I was working on my startup. And it's just, I mean, I would go complete, I would not know what day it was if it weren't for him coming home at you know, five o'clock. His routine keeps you regulated. <laughs> and I have to make dinner, so I have to like stop working. And then he wants me, he's very demanding with um, like our time. So it, well, right, for right, so. rightly so to right. some degree. It, it saves me from going crazy. But I would you, be working you have to have it. constantly. You yeah. have to have it. It's and so, it's so critical. My wife often accuses me of not having anything, any life, any thoughts outside mm -hmm. of the film world because I do if I'm fortunate enough to fall asleep in my dreams mm -hmm. I'm working on projects I wake up with things in progress I get up I go to my desk I spend time at my desk I walk away from my desk and while I'm helping cook dinner I'm working over things in my head I mean it's right. never gone it is always there and there are times when that does create sufferance in the relationship mm -hmm. so it is important that we all have that anchor, and I'm glad each of you have something like that. I want to thank you both for being here. Um, we are coming to the end of the show. Um, I want to announce that the Marshall Pictures and Rising Fire co-production of Dark Dance will be holding some auditions this Friday, 5 p.m. to 7.45 at Caritas Village. Uh, again, that's 5 o'clock p.m. till 7.45 p.m. this Friday, uh, May 10th. Thank you. Um, at the Caritas Village, and we will be looking for a number of different support roles and maybe one or two of the actual key roles. So come on out, give us an audition, and hopefully you'll end up in one of our feature films. Uh, that said, can, work continues on Nature of the Beast, work continues on Grimjack, we're looking at Afterlife, and yeah. uh, we're looking at the revisions on the Nature feature script. So there's a lot of work going on at Rising Fire. Uh, we will be holding our classes uh, tomorrow night and mm -hmm. every Monday night downtown. Uh, if you ever wanted to try your hand at acting, if you're a public speaker, if you're just someone who has issues with your confidence and how you present yourself, whether that's through dance or any other medium, just for job interviews, come on out. We teach you how to create character, how to become confident and comfortable in the character that you present to the public in front of you. Because Lord knows I've acted in every one of my job interviews. Everybody in this world <laughs> acts every day. Uh, we'd like to thank you. This was episode 16. We'll be back next week with episode 17. Uh, as we go out of here today, we're going to take a look at a couple of more performances by Fatty McClure. What do you got lined up for us, Kent? Uh, All right, well, we'll start off with your performance of the American Beauty from the cult films mm -hmm. performance, and he'll follow that up with something else. And on behalf of myself... And myself. And our partner behind the camera, Marcus mm -hmm. Ken Hampson, have a good week. Thanks, guys. My name is Lester Burnham. <laughs> this is my neighborhood. This is my street. This is my life. I'm 42 years old. In less than a year, I'll be dead. <laughs>